Hi there and welcome to Plant CEO. In today's episode, I'd like to welcome Chris Bryson, the founder and CEO of New School Foods. How are you doing, Chris? Doing great. How are you doing? Yeah, good. I'm glad we managed to get you on the show after speaking a few times now. <laughs> Same here. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So how's things going in Toronto at the moment? You could ask me any city in the world. I, I spend all my time at work, so I'm, I'm not on the up and up in Toronto, but so far it's pretty beautiful. It's a nice sunny day, but yeah, things are great. Let's start about you telling me a little bit more about New School Foods. Um, what was your motivation in starting it? Sure. So New School Foods is a company that I founded back in 2020 expressly with the purpose of creating a new technology that would allow us to make better meat and seafood alternatives, specifically what are called whole cuts of meat. So that's like uh, a steak, a filet. So the larger pieces of meat that aren't broken down into, into ground products. So we started that three years ago and it really came out of, it wasn't, it wasn't my plan to like, to start a company. I was actually angel investing at the time. I had sold another business previous to that. I was in, uh, you know, for the first time in my life, not working a hundred hours a week. And I didn't want to start another company, but after spending a couple of years in the angel investment world, learning about alternative protein companies and being very passionate about supporting that cause, it became very apparent to me that there were some gaps and those gaps led to an itch. And that itch turned into to me funding a series of, of, of R&D projects and, and that sort of snowballed into, into New School Foods becoming a proper company. And what was your motivation to pick a seafood uh, mm -hmm. and especially what you're doing now with, with salmon? So a couple of reasons. Um, one was purely from uh, a market penetration perspective. There, there's clearly a lot of other companies that are pursuing whole cuts um, and most of them tend to focus on steak. Not many of them tend to focus on fish or other, other structured meats. So it felt like there was less competition there. And so from a market opportunity perspective, there was maybe a, a greater opportunity to become the leader in that space, and then maybe subsequently consider moving into other categories. The second reason, and I believe the main reason we pursued that, was really about product strategy and the science and giving clear directions to our scientists around what to pursue. And when you think about whole cuts of salmon, to me, that's like the highest bar in terms of uh, difficulty of problem to, to tackle. Because if you yeah. think about um, a filet of salmon, like, actually, I'm curious, I'll put you in the spot. How yeah. would you describe, uh, you know, a piece of salmon that you would buy at the grocery store? Um, well, first of all, it's slightly difficult for me because I haven't really eaten fish before. So it's like, Fair enough. Um, so I wouldn't you've say, seen it, yeah. Um, yeah, I've seen it and it's, um, and I always, you know, try to ignore it when I see it on the shelves, to be fair, um, yeah. because I just don't like, you know, kind of uh, the process, obviously, that it went through. Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, I'm not sure actually how I'd describe it because I don't really know the ins and outs of the different varieties, I guess. Oh. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one for me, actually. Okay. Um, fair, how would you describe the color? Maybe to, to point. Yeah. So I think, I mean, for, for sure, one thing that I do have insights on um, was after I interviewed Ali Travelbazy from um, Sea Spiracy and mm -hmm. seeing that, that um, documentary, uh, especially around farm fish. And uh, the the appalling state, obviously, um, the breed, you know, the breeding process plus how bad is it, it is for 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 the fish swimming around in their own effectively excrement, um, and the only way to color that fish is by putting artificial colors colors into the fish to right. get it into a scale onto the shelves. Yeah, so they actually use. Um... Yeah, that supplement, which actually comes from an algae source called, uh, or it's a it's a product called astaxanthin that they'll they'll drop astaxanthin pellets into the into the pens in order to give them the color because the pens don't give the salmon the access to the nutrients they would get in the wild, which gives them their red color. So it actually part of that is why 
Um, the, the fish that you see at the grocery store is so bright, so vivid. It's also because they're much fattier than you would, um, than you would get in the wild. So it tends to actually lighten up the color of fish. So if you, if you look at wild salmon, it tends to be a darker hue, a darker red, whereas, um, the salmon that is farmed tends to be a brighter pinkish orange. And so, so anyways, so, so you know what I'm talking about and, um, one of the, one of the points of inspiration coming back to your your, your yeah. question about like why salmon salmon um, when you buy it in the grocery store obviously it's sold raw it's not sold cooked and we wanted to be able to create a product that would feel natural um, if you look at how people feel about today's plant based products they're starting to fall out of love or out of sync with what's being put on the market at first when they launched they were pretty cool and they were different and they were novel but they don't quite feel like they capture the right experience and i, I use that word experience explicitly because we often talk about taste and texture but we don't talk about things like the importance of the cooking experience food is much more than just what you put in your mouth it's a whole process so so the reason why we picked salmon is when you think about salmon and recreating that look. And, and unfortunately, farmed fish is the dominant format or type, if you will. We want to be able to create a product that looks like that. And then when you put it on the grill or in the oven, it transforms. And salmon and fish in particular has this very shiny, semi-translucent kind of like glossy look to it. And the problem, part of the inspiration for starting New School Foods was the realization after learning more about the science of how we make the existing plant-based products today is that today's technologies cannot create what I just described to you. It cannot create a product that starts out looking like a gel that's shiny and semi-translucent. And then when you cook it, it transforms. And the reason for that, um, to geek out with you a little bit, is that today's plant-based meats are predominantly made using a process called extrusion. And extrusion uses heat and it uses shear in order to create muscle fibers, to create texture. And so the problem with that is that when you use heat, you cook it so it doesn't look, there's no way it can look raw. So salmon in particular looks much more shiny and semi-translucent and raw, quote unquote raw, than other pieces of meat. So I felt that if we pursued salmon and we're able to find a technology that could create something that looks like raw salmon and transitions from raw to cooked that we could do anything else so to me salmon was like the top was the bar obviously it's you know the most commonly consumed fish in, in north america so there's lots of other sort of market data reasons but there was a very strong product rationale for picking salmon and setting a north star that seemed candidly impossible and a lot of scientists when i first met with them they're like you're crazy there's no way this is possible so when they told me that i was like you're the person i want to work with you understand <laughs> the complexity of this problem nice and so tell me um how far you've got especially in terms of the the technology and the process that you're using uh, mm -hmm. to recreate it well, we've been developing this this technology for the last three years, and uh, we've we've been awarded a patent. We've submitted multiple other patent applications. There's multiple different um, subsets or steps within our process. So there's, there's, for example, there's a step for how we create muscle fibers, which obviously that's really important. If you think about meat and seafood, all of it has muscle fibers. So that's one part. We have a whole other process around how we create connective tissue. So in salmon, um, most predominantly, you would think of those as like the white lines or the fat, right? So actually those white lines are a combination of fat and connective tissue. So we have a whole process of how we create those white lines and that substance and then how we bring it together with muscle fibers, um, how we create a shape that looks like a salmon filet. So there's a variety of different steps and we've we've been deep in R&D for, for, for a period of time because um, breaking, breaking, quote unquote, a whole new process is, is complicated. And there's a lot of fundamental science that needs to be understood to figure out how to consistently produce the product. So we're now at the point where, um, quite excitingly, we're, we're now taking the product on the road. We're demoing it with chefs. Uh, it looks like salmon. It cooks like salmon. It tastes like salmon. It also flakes like salmon. And um, and the response has been very positive. And our, our intention is to go live to market next year. So 
Um, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, awesome. Uh, so that's that's great progress then if you're looking to get into uh, retail, I guess, next year, right? We're, we're actually going to start with restaurants. So okay. we're, um, we're, we're kind of holding off on retail. And, and part of the reason for that is I think that if you go right into retail, there might be the misconception that if you build it, they will come. I don't think that's necessarily true. We're still in a period where a lot of people don't even know that alternative proteins exist. And certainly if you were to launch an alternative seafood product, people wouldn't necessarily know to look for you. Um, so I think we need to first, before we put it in the grocery store shelves and people are looking for it, you need to create that buzz and that demand first. And I, I sincerely believe that working with restaurants where you work with chefs, the true culinary experts, if they can create an exciting dish, that's going to get people more excited to try it. You're going to create an experience around it. And then once they've experienced that, um, you know, all the different things that we're trying to bring to the table, then I think they'll be more excited about buying it in the grocery store. So mm -hmm. I think we need to first build back credibility with customers. We need to get chefs excited. If we can get chefs excited, we can get everyone else excited. Right. And do you have like a certain type of restaurants in mind? Is it like high end sort of fine dining that that sort of level that you want to go for first? I, I would call it, you know, sit down uh, a place that's not rushing you out of your chair and trying to flip tables as quickly as possible. We And, you know, there's a few reasons for that. Obviously, for any food tech company that's starting out, your pricing is going to be higher than when you're building and the, developing the product in a much larger manufacturing facility where you have economies of scale. Um, so obviously your price points, your production costs are going to be higher in the early days. So it's easier to work with potentially uh, an establishment that's a bit more fine dining. But I think there are, there are other reasons. It's not just economics. You also want to make sure that when someone is trying a whole new product, a whole new, like people have never seen a filet of salmon that's plant-based. And when we bring it to people, their eyes light up and they think, oh my God, this is, I didn't think this was possible. Certainly not with plants. And we want to make sure that that, that experience is properly enabled and captured. If, if we're doing that through a quick service restaurant, you know, where they're trying to flip tables, you're not going to have someone like basking in that moment and internalizing it and then sharing it with their friends and family. And that's really, I think for this industry as a whole, we need to get people excited again. So that's that's why yeah. we want to start with restaurants that can enable experiences. Right. And I guess the other important one is manufacturing and scale. If you were to go into retail, it'd have to be very operationally and, and have the full production capabilities to, to reach scale, to go into how many retail stores. So it, I guess it's also will help you with your funding and also development, I guess, going going further until you sort of fine tune it even more and more. Exactly. You got it. Yeah. And let's talk about the the flakiness, because I guess that's quite an important aspect of fish. Mm -hmm. You want to see that. How much of a challenge was that to sort of replicate? Uh, yeah. I mean, that is uh, the essence of, of, of the problem with recreating fish. Um, it's not to say that, for example, flavor is, is an insignificant challenge. It is difficult. But let's say you just solve flavor um and and the texture's not right like you don't want to give someone salmon yogurt uh salmon yogurt would probably be pretty disgusting um <laughs> you have to texture is a very important part of the experience and and yes the word is typically the word that's typically associated with fish and salmon is flaky and so to unpack that a little flakiness is actually enabled by two things not just one thing it's two things so when you think about salmon, you can probably mentally picture you've got the orange or pink sections and then you've got the white lines, right, that are that are sp splitting up the, the pink sections. So what's interesting is that those white lines are composed of collagen and fat. And when you heat up your salmon, what you'll probably notice with real salmon is that those white lines more or less melt. They disappear, right? You don't see the white lines uh, anymore when, when it's a cooked product, but certainly you do see when it's, when it's raw. And the reason why that's functionally important is that when those white lines melt, they allow the layers to slide off of each other and separate. So they break down into chunks or flakes. So that's part one. Part two is that then those flakes individually 
break down into muscle fibers, into these delicate little soft fibers. And you need to have both of those. You can't have just like a series of layers and chunks. And you certainly can't have just muscle fibers because if you had really long muscle fibers, you'd start to feel like land-based meat, like chicken or like beef. You have to have a series of like stacked little short fibers on top of each other. So, so the way that we went about it was actually tackling both of those problems individually and then bringing it together. So the first, I would call it year or year and a half, where the company was actually more of a hold co that was funding research. We, we, we started the company by funding research at different universities. We first funded research that was specifically around how we can create the muscle fibers themselves with a new process that didn't pre-cook the protein so that we could have that raw appearance. And then once we felt that we could create that, uh, that reliably and consistently, then we augmented that with the white lines. Um, and that was another, you know, year and a half. So it's, um, it's been a labor of love. It's pretty complex stuff, but, um, we're really excited and proud with what, we, of what we've developed. Awesome. That was uh, very well explained. Thank you. Um, so on the collagen bit, um, mm -hmm. I have you replicated collagen to use that in your, in your, in your, in your product? No, we have not. I wouldn't say that we've replicated collagen in the sense that collagen in some ways would be perceived as, as a nutritional benefit. So collagen is, is a protein, uh, is not just a binder. So we've we found non-protein um, ingredients that can sort of deliver that melting characteristic that uh, so it holds the product together, but then when you cook it, it melts. So we've recreated that part but it's not it's not delivering a whole bunch of nutritional benefits in the way that collagen would. So we're very interested in paying attention to startups. Um, for example, there's another startup here in Toronto called Liven that's working on recombinant collagen. And certainly when when those ingredients reach a price point where it makes sense to include on a product, that would be a huge added benefit because not only would it be providing that adherence, but it would also be providing something that I think consumers would perceive as, as a nutritional benefit. So got it. We're, yeah. we're, we're, we're part of the way there, but not all the way there on the, in that respect. Yeah. And I guess there's companies out there that are tackling it more, more from uh, the beauty angle. Right. Um, and yeah. I, I was thinking if there's, you know, there's a match between the two different verticals of the industries between, you know, food ingredients and the beauty industry coming together on, on, on that specific challenge, I guess. Yeah, I, my suspicion is that the the main reason for tackling the beauty segments uh, first is it, the product is most likely the same, but uh, there's different regulations when you're talking about beauty versus something that you're ingesting. And usually, when you get into food, you really need to be at the point where your your economies of scale are robust and you've driven down the price point. Whereas in beauty, you can charge much more of a premium for the same same quantity. Totally. Yep. Yeah. And. What is the product actually made from in terms of which plants are you using? Sure. So what was very important from, uh, for us from the get-go is to make sure that we weren't um, pigeonholed or, or married to one individual ingredient. It was more about how can we develop a fundamental process and technology that can work with a series of ingredients. And, and the rationale for that is that we wanted a system that was versatile so that let's say when we're when we've launched salmon and that's doing really great and we want to move to another product that we could potentially work with a different formulation or um or longer term maybe we can create two different versions of salmon that use different proteins that have different benefits so there's there's a host of reasons why we wanted to be let's say not um not beholden to one individual ingredient but i but to take to to not dodge your question um, I would say there's categories of ingredients. So what we developed is first um, first and foremost, our technology really revolves around creating scaffolds. So it's almost like um, we've recreated the structure of meat. And if you think about um, a building or a house, you first start by putting up the posts and the beams, right? So that's kind of what a scaffold is. Um, and so we've created scaffolds using what are called hydrocolloids or seaweed derived extracts. Um, and we can make that with a, a series of different um, seaweed-derived extracts. And that really creates the overall macro structure. And then we fill that in with proteins and fats and flavors and colors. The, the colors that we're using are natural. The flavors that we're using are natural. The fats that we're using are, and this is very important, 
are, are, are non-saturated fats, so they're liquid oils. And that's, I think, a, an important improvement relative to the products that are on the market today. One of the main concerns is that when you use stuff like coconut oil, you're dealing with saturated fats. And so it was very important for us that we find um, a way to include healthier oils, healthier fats in our product. Um, so we, we can use really any liquid based oil that works with our process. Um, but obviously for salmon, as you can imagine, we're using algal oils that give us like omega threes and so forth. And then for proteins, um, coming to the last bit of the puzzle, which is usually the first thing people want to know, um, we, for, for this salmon, for, at least for our version one, we're predominantly using potato protein and we're combining that, uh, with maybe a second protein as well. And, but we're not, um, we're not necessarily, like I said, sort of married to that individual ingredient. Um, so I think with every product that we make, it's going to be a different formulation. So that'll be like, is it potato starch or some sort of isolate, I guess? It's an isolate. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. And in terms of the actual other plants that you're using, is other than the fats, I guess, are you using any any others that you can talk about other than the potato for the main sort of protein element? I mean, th that is the majority of the ingredients. So, okay. so the scaffold itself is is seaweed extra, they're hydrocolloids. Um, what goes into the muscle fibers are, are just the proteins and then the flavors and, and colors. And um, and then the, the fats that are included in the product as well, those are um, typically we're blending an algal oil, maybe with a secondary oil um, that we're using for flavor benefit or for, um, yeah, other benefits. Got it. And um, what are your thoughts on 3D printing? And are you using any of those uh, techniques in your process manufacturing? So, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I, I, one of the one of the governing, um, if you will, philosophies that we've applied within the team is that when we're creating something in the lab, let's say a new new technique or a new process, we're trying to ensure that that process can be carried out not just at a lab level, but by but at an industrial level by an existing piece of equipment. So a big part of how we approach our engineering is to start by looking at what's already out there, usually in the meat or the fishing or the coffee or the wine industry. You know, there's a there's so much equipment out there. And um and we've been very successful at at at, at taking what happens in the lab and finding corresponding piece of equipment. So we have we've stayed away from technologies like 3D printing where there isn't an existing at scale infrastructure that's available because at, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we create um, something that is going to scale rapidly over the next decade um, because we think we, you know, obviously if you look at climate change, if you look at animal agriculture, these are very, very significant widespread global problems. And so part of the, the product strategy and, and the engineering strategy has been, let's use off the shelf equipment. Let's make sure that this is super, super, super scalable stuff. Yeah, that uh, makes a lot of sense um, because you don't want to go into something that's also, I guess, is still nascent in its technology and not able to scale yet. Right. And and you, you also don't want to be responsible for just creating the process, but also manufacturing at scale equipment that then is going to manufacture your product. I mean, that's um, that would be a massive capital undertaking. And I think especially in today's financial market, that's going to be difficult to get investor support for that kind of stuff. So if we, you can use off the shelf equipment, sure, you're buying equipment and there's CapEx cost, but at least you're not building it from scratch. Yeah. You mentioned in the beginning about some of the current sort of plant-based companies using heat extrusion uh, techniques. Um, are you using sort of more like freezing techniques? We are. We're using um, a freezing technology that was actually one of the first academic projects that we funded. It was all around using um, what's called directional freezing in order to create structure and texture. Uh, and that was very intentional because it doesn't use heat. So, so the proteins in our product remain uncooked. Um, so it, it actually... I don't want to take. I don't want to make it seem like we're taking all the credit for pioneering that. It was actually a technology that was loosely explored in the '70s by General Foods, um, and I think at the time there weren't the same ingredients, there wasn't the same toolkit, there wasn't the same market demand, so it kind of got kicked to the graveyard and not explored further. 
And when we when we looked at that technology, we we thought of different ways of doing it differently and doing it better, arguably. And so um, so there it, we weren't the first ones to experiment. In fact, there are a lot of people that play with directional freezing for ceramics, so it's used in other industries. It just hadn't necessarily been done the way that that we did it, um, and for food. Yeah. And um, let's talk about like just that early, early days of the funding, especially with the, the university projects and um, which I think is a great idea because obviously universities need funding and it needs sort of commercialization at the end of the road. Right. So can you talk to me about how you went about doing that and working with these universities and, and trying to pick which universities you would work with and what projects you wanted them to work on? Yes. So when I got started, it was kind of a, a reaction to, like I said, the experience that I was having as an angel investor. And I I, I had sort of set out to go and make a, a whole bunch of angel investments. So um, I felt that because my background was actually in, from the software industry, that I had no business getting involved in food and food tech. So I thought the best way that I can help is maybe through coaching, angel investing. And so I I'd set out this plan. I was going to find 20, 30 startups that were super exciting, lots of great R&D, and I'm going to fund them. And that's it. And I ended up finding way less companies that I wanted to invest in than I had planned. So as a reaction to that, that sort of informed the, the thesis of there is arguably a lot of R&D that is not being sufficiently explored. And I think part of that was a reflection of the market. So at the time, that was that was back like between 2018 and 2020. In the good old days of, of alt protein, when everyone was super excited and you had a lot of new investors in the space getting involved who didn't necessarily understand food. And everyone had this massive FOMO. You had investors who wanted to get involved in food. They were looking at the Beyond Meat stock, which at the time was, I think, 200 or 300 bucks. Um, it was a very different period. And, and a lot of those investors, I think, were pushing startups to skip over R&D and just go, 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 get live, you know, get data. And, and arguably applying a lot of this, like, fail fast mentality that comes from the software industry. But in my biased opinion, that doesn't hold up in food. You can't leave a bad taste in someone's mouth. You can't fail fast uh, with, you know, repeated food trials if someone wants to puke when they <laughs> try your product. <laughs> yeah. so, so, I, I, so coming back to your question, um, the, the sort of hypothesis at the time was, okay, uh, a lot of people are not investing in R&D in plants or they're skipping all the way to cultivate it. I think there's a missed, there's a, there's an undiscovered territory here around R and D for plants. So because I wasn't finding startups to invest in, I started investing instead in academic research projects. So what I did is I, I found a scientific advisor and I said, look, how can we take this grandiose goal of a whole cut salmon? How can we break that down into six projects? And so he helped me do that. And then we created a call for proposals around six projects. And we went to some of the best food science universities in the world. And we said, look, we, we'll take your applications. We'll fund your research for a year. Um, send us your proposals. And so we got a whole bunch of proposals that were sent in. We picked the ones that were most exciting. And, and for the other part of your question, we, we, we collected funding um, from a grant agency here in Canada. And then we matched that with funding that I put into the business. And that was very intentional. I didn't want to immediately go to investors because at this point they were just research projects. There wasn't, there was no quote unquote meat on the bone and, and investors don't typically like to fund R and D. So it was very important to me that if I was ever going to do another company again, that there was something proven. So I wanted to put my money into it. We then got it sort of doubled through some grants and that allowed us to fund a, a total of six projects. And that way I knew that if I came out of those six projects with something that had been proven, that that had that had legs that, that we saw as like having a huge amount of potential, then we could get that funded by traditional VCs. Got it. That's uh, very smart, especially with, I guess, going back in those times where you, you might have got uh, somebody who's like a chief a food scientist as a, as a co-founder, but then they just don't have the scale um, to, to, as in they need, they need more people on their team. Right. 
And you wouldn't totally. necessarily have that from the beginning, whereas to reach out to multiple universities exactly. and have the projects going on at simultaneously is is very smart way to go about it. And it, it's not just people it, or, or bandwidth from a, from a resources perspective. It's also lab access. So right. when, you, when you fund academic research, part of the benefit is that you're not you're usually funding, let's call it a researcher, but then you get access to the, the minds that are in the lab as well. The professor is usually opining. You're getting access to, in some instances, like multi-million dollar uh, labs that have like lots of equipment. So you're, it's kind of like a, a rent model as opposed to a buy model. And, and that can be very, very cost advantageous. And certainly if you can split your funding across multiple projects, you're kind of treating it like a portfolio approach to R&D. So that was that was very intentional. And, and in fact, like when we did that, I didn't know whether or not it was going to become a company. Like to me, that was the test that had to be passed before deciding if it was going to turn into a company. Uh, so so yeah, I think coming back to your the observation that you made, I think that academia is a is a really untapped area for for um for companies, but you have to figure out how to work with academia in a commercially structured manner because usually academia wants to sort of say, cool, I really like this project. I'll come back in six months with a paper or report. And that doesn't work. So we we actually had to approach it in a completely different manner with most of the uh, most of the projects that we funded. So so how did you work on that uh, commercial model and were you protected in terms of the IP that the university would have created? So most of the time when you're funding research with the university, even though you're paying for the time, the university will retain the rights to the, the IP that is developed. So what we did up front is we pre-negotiated the terms upon which we could acquire the technology if something was discovered and developed. So that was a very important point for me. And some universities were willing to do that. Some universities were not. Um, and that, that you know, that thinned the crowd, but but things obviously still still worked out. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, it does. So I, I guess from, uh, you know, when you have those multiple universities that you're working with, you whittled it down to those six projects. Did you all, cr- did for all those six projects, did you create an upfront sort of deal that if, if we, um, at some point we want to acquire it for all the ones that you worked with? Yes, that was yeah. very, very important. So, so I would say, you know, in the way that we worked with universities that is arguably different, um, there was the pre-negotiation of IP. Um, and then there was, um, I think you'd also asked about how we structured the relationship in a way that's different. So we also insisted, for better or for worse, that we would have weekly t- or bi-weekly touch points. And part of the idea there was that we wanted the projects to be more agile than your standard academic research project. So usually an academic research project will go very deep on a very specific thing. What we wanted to do instead is go wide, but shallow on a lot of things. Like basically turn over a bunch of rocks and see what had potential and then go deeper where where we saw potential. And, And in that respect, you can only write a rough outline of what you're planning to do, but hopefully let the results dictate where you end up going. Whereas in a standard project, you would just go deep on that and the the project scope would not change at all. So that iterative structure to the project, I think, was was different. And the notion that we would check in weekly was also different. Um, I was asking a lot of stupid questions, but that was also an education for me that helped me understand whether or not there's real scientific potential. Can we turn this into a business? Um, But it was and it was fun, you know, candidly getting to see the results sort of come in on a weekly basis. Yeah, totally. And were you specifically sort of happy with like, like if you had to call out like one or two universities that you were super proud of in terms of the mm-hmm. challenge you set them to the result, the end result that you got, uh, which which ones would you would you say? So there are three in particular I would mention. So um, our muscle fiber technology was developed at Toronto Metropolitan University, so here in Toronto, and and you know, it was, it's the core of our platform, um, I would say. And we were lucky enough and fortunate enough to keep funding that researcher and eventually get that researcher to join our company full time. Um, We also funded, 
a lot of flavor research with both McGill University and St. Francis Xavier University. And they did um, both what's called GCO and GCMS or gra gas chromatography, olfactometry and gas chromatography, mass spectrometry research, which is basically like an analytical or a machine driven way of, of uncovering flavors and detecting sort of aromas, things like that that would help us create more authentic flavors. Um, so they, they, they all did phenomenal research that really helped us identify what makes salmon salmon. Um, and the reason that's important is it's very easy to create a fishy taste. It's much harder to create a salmon taste, something that feels distinctly species specific. And we knew that if we were going to create a successful product, we had to cross that barrier of just being fishy to something that feels like truly salmon. Yeah. Awesome. And, um, if you were to compare, you know, salmon with your product, like mm -hmm. on the, on the nutritional profile, um, I don't know how we can compare it or if you have a way that we can compare the profile of each, what would you say? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's so many dimensions, right? There's everything from protein to fats, to, uh, to iron, to cholesterol. Uh, we didn't include cholesterol in our product. Um, so, so you don't want to match on everything, but there are certain right. things, you, what you really want to look at is what, what does the consumer expect? That's, that's sort of the typical starting point because at the end of the day, we're not creating a product. Um, for ourselves, we're not creating a product primarily for vegans and vegetarians, as much as my heart is with them, um, you know, as someone who is plant based, but I, I really wanted to create a product that is going to appeal to a wider audience so that we could have incremental impact. And, and so the first thing that people say when I say, when I tell them that we're working on creating plant based salmon is they ask, will it have the same amount of omegas? That's the implicit expectation, because what they're indirectly telling you is, well, why would I have plant-based salmon if it's not giving me one of the main benefits that I look for when I eat salmon? So it's very important that we deliver on the main things that people get when they eat salmon. So our product has the same level of omega-3s. It's high in protein, which by the way, is very difficult to find in plant-based seafood products. Usually they have very little protein, sometimes no protein at all. We're trying to deliver about you know 20 grams of protein per filet. So that's a high protein product. Does that, by the way, compare with the same amount in fish? It's very comparable. Right. Uh, so we're trying to deliver a high protein product, same amount of omega-3s, include iron in the product, which is a major other nutritional benefit that you get from salmon. Um, but we're leaving out the cholesterol. We're leaving out the microplastics. There's no mercury. Um, you know, we're trying to provide the key benefits that you would get from salmon that people expect but produce it in a format that doesn't give you the crap, none of the garbage. Yeah, totally. That's great. I mean, uh, the, the last interview that I had was with a Hollywood stuntman. And, um, you know, he did this, uh, a vegan, obviously, <laughs> Hollywood stuntman. And he went through a process of trying different diets. One of them was that he was pescatarian. Um, and he did, He basically did this uh, blood analysis and he found that he had high levels of mercury after consuming mm. fish. And it took him a year to get that out of his system, basically. And, and now, obviously, he's vegan and, and he's he's uh, adopted that lifestyle for the last 10 years. But it awesome. is crazy how much mercury there is, right? In, yeah, in it's the... a, and it's surprisingly not that well known. Like you can get mercury poisoning from from eating fish. And I think if if as that awareness grows, because it is growing, um, people are, are going to be thinking twice about putting that in their bodies, about feeding that to their kids. Like w there are healthier ways to eat. Um, and so it's, it's important that we provide, yeah, something that the average consumer is going to crave, but without those kind of trade-offs, both from a health perspective, also from a climate perspective, from an animal rights and welfare perspective. So um, there are better ways to eat. Yeah, totally. You know, um, farm fish, mm -hmm. um, obviously, I guess, I don't know how much they would do to fil filter because it's basically they're, they're kind of trapped in nets, aren't they? I guess. And it's still the sea. So they'll probably still have mercury and microplastics, right? Is that correct or, or not? To the best of my knowledge, uh, yeah, the farm fish still is high in mercury and, and microplastics and, and they're more prone to, um, to disease as well. So you can get instances right. of sea lice 
And there's a lot more antibiotics that is put in their feed in order to combat that. So you, yeah, fish farming, if you, if you look at the, uh, the footage, um, if you look at what the fish looks like and what the environment is, you'll think twice about eating farm fish again. Yeah, I mean, it was quite explicitly shown in Seaspiracy where mm -hmm. you could actually see the different discolor, you know, when they kind of open the tank and you can see like the dead right. fish. And one of, the, one of the most telling, um, you know, things about why, why it's questionable to be, to, to be doing sort of um, uh, the, the open pen systems where the pens are actually out in the ocean is sometimes the fish kind of break out and then they quote unquote contaminate the wild fish and so there there's a lot of people who are looking to move those pens inland into these big tanks because they know that there's that much disease that if the fish break out actually will have catastrophic catastrophic effects on the wild salmon so it, it indirectly you're seeing that um yeah the fish farming that occurs is just prone to disease enablement. And, and that's just the sad reality of, of confining animals into small spaces. Disease is going to spread more easily. Um, and it's just a reality of factory farming. Wow. Yeah, I kind of picture this film being made like some single zombie fish going out there in the wild, infecting other fish and making another pandemic. It's like crazy, right? <laughs> it is. It is. Yep. Um, so... Tell me about the Canadian funding, uh, the grants that mm. you've got, because you've been really successful with with getting those grants. Was it some of them were sort of climate uh, orientated grants? Is is that the ones that you picked? And can you tell us a bit more about the funding in total and how much you've got from the Canadian government? So the the there's basically two we, we've got there's a series of different grant agencies that exist in Canada some operate at a federal level some operate at a provincial level um and so we've been the benefactors of of, of grants from actually multiple different institutions the the two largest ones or the two largest grants have come from one organization called protein industries Canada that their mission is really to enable uh more sustainable protein production in Canada and so obviously they see the benefit of a new processing technology in order to, to turn Canada's um, ingredients into finished goods. And so there's a lot of interest there. So I would say their angle has been more around uh, food supply, more so than climate, although climate I'm sure plays into it. The second grant um, that we've gotten that's been fairly substantial is from an organization called SDTC Canada or Sustainable Development and Technology Canada. And that really was angled around climate and uh, a greener food system, if you will. So total funding that we've collected to date uh, through uh, Canadian grants has been um, probably, if I translate that to US dollars, probably about $7 million. Yeah, that's awesome. That's fantastic. And then also you've raised from private equity with quite a few firms, right? Do you want to talk about some of the ones that you've been working with? Sure. So we have a really incredible group of, of investors that have gotten behind us. So when we raised our seed round last year, uh, we were able to onboard investors that include um, uh, venture capital funds that include Lever VC, Good Startup, Hatch, Allwin Capital, Clear Current Capital, Blue Horizon, Food Hack, um, Joyance, Joyful, um, Nutrie. There's a whole bunch of, of investors that um, we brought into the fold and they've been incredibly, incredibly supportive. I think they really understand the potential of our technology. So, um, yeah, we've been very fortunate in that respect. Um, and which ones out of all those I put you on the spot now, have, have you enjoyed working with the most? Oh, you're like asking to pick my favorite child. I'm not allowed to do that. Um, <laughs> to, to be honest, they, they really all have their own different, um, areas of expertise. Um, there, there are a couple that come to mind when I think of experts in like PR and marketing. Um, and, and then we have some investors that are really focused on climate and food and sustainability and are, you know, very plant-based. And then there's some that actually don't care about that stuff. Some that are just interested in, uh, you know, new markets. Um, so it depends on kind of the, we, we typically, when we have a question or something that we need help with, 
we like the fact that our investors are split between, I would call it vegan investors and non-vegan investors. It, it gives us the ability to pull perspectives and opinions from both sides of the aisle, if you will. Um, and, and like I said, there's some investors that that are that their expertise is in finance, some is in marketing, some is in distribution, some is in fundraising. So it, to be honest, it really depends on what problem I'm tackling, um, but they all have their areas of expertise and focus. Hopefully that wasn't too much of a politician answer uh, in not answering your question. <laughs> well, it was, but uh, <laughs> maybe I can try and drill on one of those. Uh, let's let's speak about the the PR and marketing because obviously my my day job is is in marketing. Sure. Um, yeah. So w- which company have you which which firm has been good to work with in, in with with so especially we've, marketing? Um, we've had uh, a couple of our investors, actually three that we've we've talked to a lot as we've gone through branding efforts. Um, so we're working with an agency right now on creating really the whole brand experience. Uh, so we've worked a lot with with good startup on that. We've worked a lot with uh, Joyful and Joyance. Um, oddly enough, we want to create a brand that is full of joy. So uh, that's probably not a coincidence that that two of the funders that have that word in their name have been yeah. assisting. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Um, so over now, I guess if you uh, look at the next year, what are you going to be focusing on? And then I'd love to hear just a little bit on when you're going out to conferences, what do actually people say to you once they've tasted the product? So for the next year, our focus is on bringing our product to market. And obviously, in order to do so, there's there's two critical things we have to do. We really have to finalize the product. So I would say that right now, when we bring the product to people, whether that's chefs or people at conferences, the response is is, is incredibly positive. Um, but it is very important to me and, and the rest of our team that we don't could create a good product, we create a great product. And so I, I don't think speed to market is the most important thing. It's really, uh, it's quality, you know, and there's lots of great companies that have proven that that strategy is a stronger strategy. Apple is never the first to market. They're always second or third because they want to one-up the first product <laughs> that's been put up to market. Um, so the, I think coming back to the first part of your question, like how, how do people respond to it? Really, it comes back to our our product strategy, which is how do we create these wow experiences? And what I'm excited about is when people see the product, their eyes light up. Kind of the reaction is, oh, I didn't think that was possible with plants. And we we make a point of cooking the product in front of people so we can show that we're not just creating a product that tastes like salmon, but it also has the same cooking experience. And that also creates a really strong response. Our intention is to, to create experiences. Um, because we know that if we succeed at that, that that's going to lead to word of mouth. That's going to lead to conversations that will help build our brand um, and drive new customer adoption. So uh, short answer is the, the initial response has been very positive. Um, there's still lots that we can improve with the product. And as we look at the next year, we just want to dial it in so that we knock it out of the park when we launch later next year. That's great. Look forward to seeing getting into all these great restaurants that are are willing to give it a shot, Mm -hmm. which is basically what you need. So just shifting gears to our other passion that we both have, which is Mm -hmm. music uh, and especially drumming, as we're both drummers and vegan Mm -hmm. drummers. Um, How do you find this uh, intersection? Because obviously you're very busy in in your day job and and work uh, and balancing what you're doing on the innovation side. And your own musical pursuits. Well, firstly, so I I play a lot of rock, um, and so drumming first at its core. The reason I love it is because I just I love music. Right? I, I think it's probably the same for you. It's just whether it's playing music or it's composing music, um, both sort of scratch different itches. But it's just uh, it's always been a, a passion of mine, something I care deeply about. Um, but in all honesty, also with drumming, it's 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 fun and therapeutic to just hit stuff, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, and um, and it's a nice way to sort of get some physical activity. Um, to almost, it's like a I see it as almost like a form of meditation, and I don't meditate, but sometimes, let's say you're I'm working on learning a new pattern or something or or a new technique on the drums. Sometimes you'll be sitting there for like an hour doing it over and over and over until it clicks with your brain. And it's a really kind of amazing experience. Like if you step back and you realize what you're doing, 
within 60 minutes, you can go from not being able to do something to being able to do something because you just sit there and you stick with it. And I think there are a lot of parallels between that and being in a startup, right? It's about sort of... Yeah, it's like perseverance, isn't it? Exactly. And I, I think that at the end of the day, if I learned anything from my last startup, I think that the most important um, driver of success is resilience. I think that those who just keep pushing through the problems and who are determined are the ones who win. It's not necessarily the smartest people. It's the people who just want it more than everyone else because they're just going to keep trying until it works. So I think there's there's that similarity there with drumming, which is it, it can be very satisfying. It can also be very frustrating. Um, and then I think when it comes to creating and composing music, something that's always been something that, that I've done, um, not just playing other music, is there's nothing more rewarding than having something in your head and then putting on, like bring something to life. I, I think that is probably my favorite thing in life. And so I get those experiences every day in the, in the startup world. Um, and with music, you get it immediately. And it's just, um, especially when you create something you're proud of, it's, uh, there's nothing like it. Yeah, it's fantastic. And what do you think of the, the more famous, I guess, vegan drummers that are out there, i.e. people like, Travis Barker from from Blink One Eight Two, and obviously you know he's married to a very uh, famous Kardashian, um, mm -hmm. and you know they're both pushing the the cause, I guess, as well. Yeah, I, to be honest, I wish I knew of more vegan drummers. Uh, I I'm not I forgot that Travis was. That's that's right. Um, I don't know to be honest. I I haven't. Um, I know of a lot of like vegan musicians. I think. I've heard that some members in Metallica. Might yeah, be. yeah. So I, I just, I just I read think about that. The deal. I'm not sure. Yeah, and I just read about Metallica and um, that when they're going on tour, they're definitely eating clean, as they call it, I guess, yeah. which yeah. is, you know, having a lot more protein from tofu, for example, but also when they're touring obviously mm -hmm. staying away from the drugs and the alcohol probably what, right. what, what they might have done back in the day um right. but as as they're getting into their 60s they want to carry on with yep. longevity and, and playing as long as and and sustaining that so there's definitely it's definitely great to see those bands that are pushing veganism forward as well right. in their own ways but also yep. yeah i definitely want to hear more about drummers that are coming out and, and actually saying that they are being being a bit more vocal. But yeah, I guess when you've got musicians like Lenny Kravitz, for example, who's very talented, but also extremely fit at his age and looks yeah. great, right? It's yeah. like, well, you know, that's that's somebody that you can look to to say, yeah, he's he's a, he's a great rocker, but he's also compassionate and he's, he's eating well, but he's very strong and he plays great music. So, you know, it's just yeah. one of those things that as a as a music industry we kind of need to embrace and then you know more i would say other than rock you've got people like you know leona lewis you've got will i am all these musicians that are becoming more vocal i would say about veganism for sure i mean i think that there's probably to no surprise there's a a huge intersection between musicians and vegan veganism or or plant-based diets and and i my guess is that my like if I had to venture a hypothesis, it's probably because as musicians, your job is to actually delve into emotions, right? You're you're trying to take emotions and put that into a song, into a product. And so when you're more connected to your heart and to your empathy, you're going to be more compassionate. And so I think that 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 increase of compassion extends to to other creatures. And so yeah, it makes sense that a lot of musicians are vegan. Uh, I think a lot of I think there's a large number that are plant based or vegan, but maybe aren't necessarily overt about it. And then you have some that are very overt. I think Moby has animal rights tattooed on his on his arms. He's very, very upfront about it. Um, and some, I think, are, you know, don't want to be controversial, don't want to necessarily alienate some of their fans. But I, I think it's a growing trend. You know, more and more artists are are becoming plant based or vocal and admitting it. I think Billie Eilish is plant-based, if not vegan. Right. So yeah. it's great. I think it's just, it's going to continue to increase. Um, and and I think it's great that it's coming from musicians because people always look towards musicians to um, see what's coming next and to set trends and things like that. Totally. And it's it's definitely a cultural thing, isn't it? And that's kind of what we need in, in the movement as well. We need to Absolutely. mix things up. Yep. Agreed. 
totally. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for coming on the show. Uh, really interesting to hear what you're doing with New School Foods. And uh, and and brilliant on on the drumming too. So keep keep rocking. <laughs> but same to you. Keep keep playing. I I, I saw you play um, that Prodigy song, and that like took me back. <laughs> Such a great <laughs> Battle of the Land. Oh my god. Yeah, that's pretty insane. Yeah, that's yeah. that's one of the good ones. Quite challenging, but yeah, it's 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 a great mm-hmm. track to play too. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Chris. Well, thanks again, and uh, we'll speak to you soon. Okay, wonderful. Hope you have a great day. Thank you for having me. Cheers. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye.